Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Minister Claudine Johnson, and today we're going to talk on blessing. But before we get started, I'm going to pray, and then we will get all started with the message. So, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ to our congregation and to our internet audience today. So if you just bow your heads where you are, if you can, if you're driving, please don't bow your head. Keep looking straight ahead while I pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word and that each day that you're giving us more wisdom, understanding, and knowledge and on the, revel on the revelation of your word. And I thank you also that you have anointed me to teach your word. And I don't take this lightly. Also, I thank you that the people have ears to hear, not so much as what I say, but what you are saying to them. So I thank you that you will continue to, that I continue to decrease as you increase in my life. And I thank you, Father, for your word and your anointing up on not only our congregation, but on our internet audience right now. In the name of Jesus, amen. Today, we're starting on blessing. I think, I can't remember if, I think this is for the first time for this month. I know they've been teaching on blessing on Tuesdays. And the title of my message is, Are You Blessed or Are You Cursed? And my foundation scripture is found in Proverbs 10, 22. And I'm going to read that for you. It says, The blessing of the Lord maketh rich, and he, add, and he addeth no sorrow with it. And we're going to get into an exegesis on that in a minute. But I'm just going to share that the purpose of this message is to help believers to better understand what is a blessing and my goal is is to help believers to understand the difference between what a blessing and what is a curse and we're going to cover this by three three points a few points i have one we're going to do that my exit my introduction is basically going to be the exegesis on proverbs 10 22 and then we're going to look at the chapter in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, which talks about blessings and curses. And then we'll, I'll share with you about the laws of blessing. And then we do, if we have a chance today, we'll talk about the Arianic blessing. <clears throat> so, for my introduction, we're going to look at, we're going to break it down a little bit. It says blessing. Blessing in Hebrew is Barak. Does that sound familiar? You think about Barack Obama, surprisingly enough. So Barak means blessing. And blessing is a favor or a gift bestowed by God, therefore bringing happiness. Blessing means to increase or bring down divine abundance. When someone says, bless you, they're asking God to increase your health, your wealth, happiness, and whatever it may be, to let his light shine on you and give you more of himself. When we say, bless God, we're saying, whatever it is, I'm increasing God's presence in this world because of my recognition of his role in creating or commanding it. Even when we bless our food, we are simply saying, I see God in my food. You know that he had something to do with it. And the second part of that verse, it says, and adds no sorrow with it which means receiving blessings from God, which means a greater blessing. There are rich people who are miserable and have great sorrow along with their riches. They have three things in common. 
They have care in getting their riches. They have fear in keeping their riches and grief in hoping that they don't lose their riches. If you don't mind, I'm going to share a little short story with you. And I want you to look at it and see if you can tell whether there's a blessing or the curse in it. I have a friend, <clears throat> and she had put some stuff in the layaway. And she went to get it out, and she still owed, I'm just going to pick a number and say $100. That she still owed on what she had in the layaway. And when she went to pay for it, the lady evidently looked at the wrong account and said, Oh, you only owe $50. So she gave the lady a hundred, but the lady gave her $50 back. So she was excited because she thought God had blessed her with the return of this $50. So she called me and was telling me about what happened. And of course, I had to burst her bubble and tell her that that was not a blessing from God. If you owed the hundred dollars, then that's what you owe. I said because even though you see it as a blessing for yourself, it would have been sorrow for the lady because when she closed out her drawer at the end of her shift, she was going to be fifty dollars short, which means that she was going to have to make that up out of her paycheck. So I'm quite sure some of you all are saying, hmm, well, I would have just saw it as a blessing and keep it. Well, after we shared that with her, she went back to the store and she got, she got it straightened out. But God could still bless her in other ways along, on, on, in another time. I'm going to share with you some more blessings for you to, to decipher, to look at. We're going to look at 1 Kings 21, verses 3 through 29. I'm not going to read it because it's going to take a while. But what I'm going to do is give you a Reader's Digest version of the story. Now this story was about King Ahab. And he, he had uh, his eyes on this vineyard which was next to the castle. And it was owned by a little guy who ran the vineyard. His name was Naboth. And both he approached him on several occasions and asked him if he would be willing to sell his vineyard. And he told him no. So the king took it personal. He stomped around, he pouted, threw a temper tantrum. And his wife comes in, and his wife, I'm quite sure you guys have heard of him, her name was Jezebel. And she wanted to know what was wrong with him. He told her that he wanted the vineyard next door and the guy wouldn't sell it to him. And she said, well, what's wrong with you? You king, can't you do or get what you want? So what she did was she went to some of his cronies and they came up with a f fake law to put in place in order to trap the, the boat into um, doing something wrong. Then she hired a couple of scrupulous, unscrupulous men to say, to talk against him. And with this, he was convicted and tried, and they took him out and stoned him. So while the king was still laying there on his bed pouting, his wife comes in and she throws him the title deed on the bed and says, here, you got the land. So now would you consider that a blessing for him? think about it or was that a curse so now he's rejoicing thinking what he wants to do he wants to tear up out the vineyard and put in a parking lot more or less and so meanwhile who walks in to visit Elijah God's prophet and he tells Elijah more or less what he did was wrong and because of that God said that he will surely die and not only him, but also the queen. And they said the dogs will eat, will lick their blood and eat their bodies and whatever. So King Ahab was smart enough to repent for what he did, which gave him a, a, a reprieve on his penalty that God had already prophesied over him. And But for some reason it doesn't say whether or not he uh, made Jezebel aware of what was going on. 
but as time went on, when uh, their town was, when Jerusalem was captured by the Syrian army, they took her and threw her body over the wall, and she was eaten by dogs. And he, in turn, got killed in battle later on, much years later. Later, he got killed in battle, and the dogs licked his blood off of the chariot. So let you know, was that a blessing or was that a curse for him? Another one I want to talk about is in Luke 18. And this is in verses 18 through 25. And this is about the rich man who, had, who was excited about knowing Jesus and he wanted to follow him. He went and told Jesus that he had followed all the commandments since he was a boy. And Jesus said, okay, well, if you feel that way, then come follow me. He said, but first, you have to let go of all your riches. And the guy, they said, was a very rich man. Now, a lot of people read that scripture and they look at it from a um, perspective. And some religions even use that to reinforce that you should be glad to be broke, to walk in poverty. Well, that's not really what this scripture is saying. When he told him about selling and giving away his, his stuff, he was more or less helping him to locate where he was. That in spite of him wanting to follow after Jesus, the point is his, his, he had a strong love for his money and for his wealth and for the possessions that he had. And so he was not really willing to let go of them when we look at some of the other disciples and some somebody's out there saying, but what about his other disciples? They were all poor. No, they were not. When we look in uh, Mark, we see where when Jesus approached the sons of Jebedee, which was James and John, he asked them to follow me. And they said he, they left their father and their hired workmen to follow after Jesus. So that let you know they must have had a little money in order to hire other people to work for them. And we also know about Joseph of Arimathea, even though he did not follow Jesus and he was not one of the 12 disciples, but he was a, a still a believer of Christ. He gave up his grave that he had dug for himself in order for them to bury Jesus in. So we have to realize that not everybody that followed Jesus was poor. And even when you look at Jesus himself, they had Judas was the the was the treasure of the ministry. So if they were broke, what do you need a treasurer for? So these are things to think about. Also, people look at it and say when Jesus made the, the statement that it's easier for a camel to, to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man. Well, again, that is another one that people have misunderstood um, because what he's saying is, is that you still have to put your priorities in place. Now, there is a, a, a door in, in, in Jerusalem and it's a door that they use, they use at night, and it, they call it the eye of the needle. And it's a smaller door, and a camel can come through that door. He just can't come through fully loaded, that he has to kneel down and crawl through. Well, but that still opens the door that it's possible that a rich man can be saved. It's not saying that the door is being slammed in their face. And so we have to realize him making that statement about it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle is kind of a, it's an idiom. It's like saying, I'm so hungry I can eat a horse. So we have to see that as just an example of them having to give up, not give up your riches, but not let them be a priority in your life. So my main point 
we're going to talk about is in Deuteronomy 28. And so when we look at Deuteronomy 28, it's interesting, it's one of our main chapters in the Bible that really focuses on the blessings of God and also the curses of God. And so we're going to break that up into three different sections. And in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, it talks about the blessings of God. And it's, it's interesting how God starts off with the positive, not with the negative. And I'm, going to, I'm not going to read all 14 verses, but I'm going to read a part of it. So in Deuteronomy 28.2, I'm going to read that part. It says, And all these blessings shall come unto thee, and overtake thee, and it shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Think about it. Our blessings shall all come and overtake us. And then we're going to drop down to verse 11. And it says, The Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods and in the fruit of thy body and in the fruit of thy cattle and in the fruit of thy ground and the land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers to give thee. So he's letting you know that he's blessing you. And then in Deuteronomy 28, we're going to go down to verse 13 and 14. And it says, And the God shall make thee thy head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only and not, not beneath. It, if thy show hearken, shall hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand, nor to the left, nor go after other gods to serve them. So we have to realize that it's important that God is saying, if you do these things, that I'm commanding you to do, that you'll be blessed in the city, you'll be blessed in the county, your body will be blessed, your land will be blessed. If you do these things, then technically you don't have to be concerned about the curses. It's unfortunately we as humans have a tendency to want to rise up and deal with the negative first before the positive. Not so much now, but it used to be a time, even when you went on a diet, they would always want to put the negative stuff, like what you cannot eat, before they would tell you what you can eat. So automatically they start you off with all the, the stuff that you can't eat, and you look at the list and say, well, this is everything that I've been eating. So by the time they get to what you can eat, lettuce and radishes and all this other stuff, you're like, You've already moved into a negative zone, and chances of you staying with that diet is not going to be good. So it's so important that you understand that. Being blessed is primarily being defined also as a communion with God. It means to expand your life. It doesn't mean that you just fill up your cup only, but it means to just make your life bigger. God blessed Adam and Eve in Genesis, and he said to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, the word replenish means to restock, resupply. And I know some people are saying right now, tilt, restock and resupply. That's for another day and another time, okay? We look at Noah. God told him the same. He said, be fruitful and multiply refill the earth also he even told abraham that when he went into a, another country he said to go forth to the land that i showed you and i want you to be fruitful and to multiply again that's saying you are being blessed is when you give out you give forward in deuteronomy 15 through 45 this talks on the curses and it says 
The cursed life is the result of life without God. Sin shrinks your life. It causes your heart to shrink and to shrivel. If you live your life is you live your life as though you are in control and you are tr you try to manipulate other people. If you know someone who is full of sin and doing a lot of stuff, you find that they'll have their little tight group of friends and they don't really like to venture out into new areas with new people. I'm going to read the verse 15 also. It says, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all his commandments, and statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And in Deuteronomy 28, we're going to drop down to 30, 43 and 44. It says, The stranger that is within me shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. And so in other words, with curses, it ends up reversing itself. Instead of you being the head and not the tail, you end up being the tail and not the head. Then we go down to Deuteronomy 45 through 68. Again, I'm not going to read it all because it's too long. And so, um, if you think, I'm going to read, let me read verse 45. It says, Moreover, all these curses shall come unto thee, and shall pursue, pursue thee, overtake thee, until thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded thee. And verse 68 says, And the Lord shall bring thee unto Egypt with ships, and by the way thereof I speak unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. There shall be sold unto your enemies for bondsmen and bondswomen, and no man shall buy you. So when we read these verses through 45 through 68, these are curses that get even worse than the ones through 15 to 44. It's like you go through the things of being cursed in the city and being cursed in the town, that your baskets will not be filled, you plant a field and it won't grow and whatever. But there are times when people will see that and they still won't accept to turn around and do the commandments that God is asking them to do. So when they do this, then God moves them still to a different level. And what he's doing is he turns them over to Satan because what they're saying is you are truly rejecting me and you are rejecting me on a more serious level. Now, if you do something wrong, don't think you will move to this level overnight. This one takes time. And if you are a person who end up doing something wrong and you still have that remorse to repent or you're feeling bad, you're, you're okay. Just go ahead and repent and turn around and move on. When you get into verses 45 through 68, these are people who now feel like what they're doing, they don't see nothing wrong with it. They are not willing to change, have no intentions of changing, and they want to continue on doing what they're doing is wrong. So hopefully that will help you to understand the book the Deuteronomy better. My main point too is on the four laws of God's blessing. Our blessing shall flow to others. And I want you to turn to Genesis 12 verses 2 through 3. Now this is God talking to Abraham and he says, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, 
and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse him that curse thee. And all thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Some people feel like when God is blessing them, it means that they're comfortable, that they're happy. It's like saying, God bless us for and no more. Well, there's a little bit more to it than that. When God is blessing others, he's also saying that you are to pass that, that blessing needs to be passed on as well to others. And we look in Luke 6.38, it says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. So that's letting you know that being blessed is something that should flow outwardly. It is not something that you take in, lock it up in your closet, and you don't share with anybody. Number The second law is when we bless others, God takes care of our needs. And my scripture in that one is in Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 11.1. 1. The scripture says, Cast thy bread upon the water, for thou shalt find it after many days. I remember when the church I used to go to, they had a song about casting your bread upon the water, and it said, and soon it would turn on every wave. And that's pretty much what happens. You, When you start giving out blessings, they will come back. And if you don't believe me, you can do something simple. You say, well, I don't have a lot of money to bless people. Well, you don't have to have a lot of money to bless people. You can bless people just doing simple things. You know, I remember once my mom told me when I was at work, she said, when you walk down the hall, smile at people. She said, one, it's going to make people wonder what you've been up to. And I found that to be true. So when you're at work or you're in the store, smile at people. Well, now with us wearing masks, it's kind of hard. But, you know, but your eyes can still show whether or not you're smiling or you're frowning. But when you smile at people, you're going to find out a couple of things. One, they're going to smile back. Some people can be walking down the hall and they have just been in a meeting, got mad and fuming, and they'll see you and they'll give you one of those little quick smiles, you know, and then they through. But then there are others who will really will smile. And what you're doing is you're blessing them with a little scent or hint of happiness. It may not only last until they pass you, but least is something. So it's so important when you learn how to bless others. I know uh, when Jews go to the temple on Saturdays, they purposely put money in their pocket coins so that when they see the beggars in front of the synagogue, they give coins to the beggars. Now, what you don't all know is that a lot of times the people that are there begging are not begging for themselves. A lot of them are begging for other people who can't, they, they don't have the ability or they can't come out and beg for themselves. So what they would do, they would come to the temple and the people would give them money and whoever the people are that they are begging for, they would take that money that they collect and they divide it among those who, who they were representing. So, of course, that's still part of the blessing. And as God is blessing them, he blesses you because then he'll give you more so that you can bless others. We have to understand we cannot outgive God. And so it's, it's so important. <clears throat> so God is not one who is a hoarder of wealth. He wants you to understand that rich, our riches are not ours. It belongs to him. It is important to understand that the purpose of blessing is to acknowledge that you only have one source. And this was a revelation that I just picked up on a couple of weeks ago listening to Keith Moore on, on, on the Southwest Believers. And he said he would say how someone blessed him for something. And he said God stopped him and said, you only have one source. He said, I use people as channels. So when you are being blessed, 
thank God for that blessing. Don't you see that person as your source because they are not. God only used them. And it's something interesting to know that if you are looking to someone for something and they disappoint you because they didn't give you what you thought, or even if you gave something to someone but you gave it to them with interpretation of they were going to give back to you and they don't, then you still have to realize who is your source. Then that means you're looking to that person as your source and not God. And so that is so serious. So if you give to someone they don't give back, don't get mad with them because that lets you know that your focus was not in the right place. God is your source, not people. People are just a channel in which God is using to get things to you. And that if you keep your focus on Him, then people will not frustrate you, disappoint you, make you angry. You can look at them and smile because they're not your source. That is so important for us to hold on to. Number three. Our blessing is to others so they will come back to us. And my scripture again is in Luke 6.38 where it says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye met with all, it shall be measured unto you. So you have to realize the more you bless others, the more that you will receive things in return. You cannot outgive God. That is something that we all need to understand. And then, like I said before, you may not get it back the same way you think. So just leave yourself open to receive it in whatever direction He wants to give it. Moreover, <clears throat> you um, number four is you are more expected the more you have the more it is expected of you and this is in Luke 12 48 and uh, part B it says for up unto but unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required and to whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more when God has blessed you with a talent or a skill, wealth or knowledge, in order for you to maintain that, you have to learn how to give. If you have a talent of playing the piano, he did not give you that talent of piano just for yourself, for you to sit locked up in your house and playing the piano. It is for you to share that talent with others. It's the same way with your wealth, you find out a lot of rich people, which they may not advertise, give away a lot of money. And because they give away money, money comes back to them. So we have to learn to do that as well. You give and it shall be returned to you. Main point three is the blessing is a form of giving. And we kind of touched on that in the last part of the uh, part, uh, main point two. But my scripture is in, it says, blessing of God is love and healing. And my scripture is in John 3, 16. And most people know that scripture, but in case you don't, I'll read it. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. All of God's blessings flow out of his love for us. God uses people who can minister to, to, to people who have had the same wounds and heal. Usually you'll find people who have, women who have been raped or someone has been tortured. God will use that example for them to be able to minister to others because they can say, I identify with where, where you are. 
Well, we look at it and say, well, okay, but well, God did the same thing. That is one of the reasons why he gave up his kingship to come to earth to live as a human in order to know and to identify with us so that when we talk to him about, well, Lord, you don't understand. Well, yeah, he does because he has come to earth to live as we did, learning to be hungry, to be thirsty, to be tired, to be sleepy, so that he can identify with us. It would be, for instance, if you you look at an ant and you don't think anything about an ant, but if you had the opportunity to spend the day as an ant, you will have a different revelation on what a, what a land's life is really like. So this is what God has done. <clears throat> has anyone ever been on a job where you've had a supervisor who came right out of college and has, he's got the theory, but he's had no practical? Well, that would be a scary supervisor to follow. Usually most people would like to have somebody who has some idea of what the job really entails. Well, that's why Jesus came to earth, was to find out what it was really like to live as a human on this earth. And then he turned around and then gave his life for us. That shows you how much love that he has for us. And my next one is the blessing of being in Christ Jesus. And my scripture is in Ephesians 1, 3 through 4. And it says, Blessed be the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love spiritually and heavenly blessings are our best blessings with which we cannot be miserable we can without which we cannot be blessings were made known to believers but the lord showing to us the mystery of his sovereign will and the method of redemption and salvation. He dispenses all of his blessings according to his good pleasure. And God has laid up spiritual blessings for us in his son, the Lord Jesus, but requires us to draw them out and fetch them when we pray. So that's why he tells us to pray. Because as we pray, we're pulling down those spiritual blessings out of the heavenly realm and we're pulling them into the natural realm. That's why it's so important for us to pray. And my last one, I hope I got a couple of minutes to get this one in. This is called The Blessings of the Good News of Jesus. Now Jesus' death brought victory for us over death, sin, and the world and the power of Satan. There are the great enemies of every human being which Satan tries to use. So in Romans 5, 12, and 15, we, <clears throat> he says, we were sin was entered into the world through one man, that was Adam. And it was won over by another man, which was Jesus, on, and when he was on the cross. And this was the catalytic battle between the power of God and the power of Satan. And this was all through the cross. When Jesus said, it is finished, he was proclaiming victory over Satan and the power of darkness. And we can read about that in Colossians 2.15. It is definitely good news that the cross shattered all human expectations. We see that the scourging of Jesus for our sins, but our end doesn't end there. It is the doorway that we all have to pass through 
to be able to reach the Father and to seek new heights. So it's so important that we realize that the blessings all come through God and for us. So in summary, the blessing of the Lord truly is to make us rich. And it is also not to add sorrow. It is important that we understand the difference between worldly blessing and godly blessings. And hopefully today it will help you to be able to make the difference. In review, we talked about King Ahab and how he walked in worldly blessing and had to repent for his treachery of his wife. We talked about the rich ruler in Luke and his zeal for seeking after God but was not willing to make a sacrifice. And we shared about Deacon in Deuteronomy 28. We looked at the blessings and the curses and also the four laws of God's blessing. Is giving is the main focus of blessing. It's not to keep it for yourself but to share with others. And of course, that giving is also a form of blessing because it is more blessed to give than to receive. Oh. So right now, since we're at the end of this and we talked about Jesus, and <clears throat> we want to, I want to give someone the opportunity, if you like, to be able to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Um, in order to receive the blessings of God, you have to be a child of God. And to be, have curses, those if you, you don't have to be a, a child to receive those, those come automatic. So if you are there in the, in the internet audience and you have never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, this is a golden opportunity time for you to accept. Uh, a lot of times people will tell people that they need to be saved, but they don't always tell them how. So today, if you don't mind, if you can, and not in a place where you're driving or whatever, I would like to repeat, have you repeat after me this prayer. If you say it with me, please. Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. You said in your word, that if I will confess my sins and, and accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, I will be saved. So I thank you now in Jesus' name that I am saved, that I am whole. And I ask you right now, Father God, to take my life and do something with it. Do something special with it. So I thank you and I praise you for it right now in Jesus' name. And for those who have accepted the Lord right now, and if you want to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you receive the Holy Spirit. Just say, Father, I just ask to receive your Holy Spirit right now with the evidence of speaking in other tongues right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh. So right now, we're going to say a benediction. And the benediction is, uh, bena means good. Diction means word, speak. So I'm going to speak good over you. Father, we just thank you and we praise you for each and every one who has listened in to our message today. I pray blessings upon each and every one. I pray blessings that you bless them and those who have accepted you today, Father, that you let them know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are real and that you have become a part of their life. So we thank you, Father, and we praise you for your hedge and protection around them as they travel to and fro that your angels are encamped around them from top to bottom, side to side, and back to front. And there'll be no mishaps, flat tires, breakdowns on their travels today. So we thank you and we praise you for it right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. My time is up and I thank you for yours.